My name is uh, Professor Masoud Baderin. I teach Islamic law in the School of Law of the School of Oriental and African Studies. Islamic law has been taught at the School of Law here at Suez since 1948 when the department was first established. And we continue to teach it up till the uh, current moment. It is quite clear that the relevance of Islamic law is quite um, important now in relation to its application in Muslim majority countries, in relation to its uh, influence on the lives of Muslims living in diaspora, and also its relevance to the discourse around international law, international human rights law globally now. All along Islamic law has been one of the important specialized courses that we teach at SOAS. And we teach in a, it in a way that brings the course to life and also uh, make it quite understandable to, to the students. There's no gain saying the fact that Islamic law is, uh, is it's a, it's a complex system of law. But then the way we teach it, by the end of the course, students usually or always uh, express satisfaction uh, about their understanding of it. Now we teach it in a specialized way, as I said, uh, we teach it from both a historical perspective and evolutional perspective, that is both historical and evolutional. By doing that, students are able to see the development stage by stage from the pre-classical period into the classical period up to the post-classical period and into modern times. Normally, we start the course with the question about whether or not Islamic law is law. That is, is Islamic law really law? And this takes us into the debate of what one really means by law. We look at this from both a positivist perspective and from the natural law perspective, and then examine the context of Islamic law within that debate. I mean, we do not rely only on modern uh, contemporary English materials. We also make reference to traditional materials, I mean, in that regard. Now, we also look at the question of the debate between law and morality in relation to Islamic law. And then we move on to look at the different relevant uh, terminologies so that students are able to really appreciate um, the course very well. Because as Islamic law, the basis of it, the language of it is Arabic. Students need to appreciate some basic terminologies such as the Sharia itself in relation to what does it mean and the different ways by which it is used. And then the terminology Fiqh, for example, and we look at terminologies like ijtihad, for example, hukum, for example, ahkam, and so on and so forth, so that students are able to uh, understand these basic concepts uh, and understand them as we move on. Now, we then, in the first part of the course, we cover extensively uh, Islamic legal theory, that is Islamic jurisprudence, otherwise called usul al-fiqh in Arabic. And in that regard, we mainly look at the sources, the methods, and the principles of Islamic law. And as I said earlier, we look at it both from a historical and evolutional context. Now, in looking at the sources, we consider mainly the Quran as the major source of Islamic law. We look at it and uh, examine its nature, its content, its subject matter, and the legal content it contains. Now, then we move on to look at the Sunnah as well, which are the two major sources. Now, when we start with the Quran, we look at it a bit in a historical context about how it was revealed and also its divine nature. Now, after looking at that, there's the, 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 we examine the question of whether the Quran itself can be considered as uh, a code of law, that is a, a book containing uh, law, because it's a divine revelation, and how does can it be used in order to regulate the temporal 
life of human beings. Now, in looking at that, we also look at the, the science of tafsir, that is, the science of interpretation of the Quran. Uh, and in doing that, we look at it, I mean, the material, the intrinsic uh, methods of interpretation, then extrinsic methods of interpretation. We look at all these, such as the concept of Asbab al nuzul for example, that's occasions of revelation. We look at it both literally, contextually, and all the different rules of interpretation. Because that's, I mean, uh, every student of Islamic law is expected to know there are specific rules of interpretation uh, of the Quran, and we look at this, I mean, uh, seriously. Then we also look at its content, that is the legal content. Uh, because there's a big debate about uh, the volume of legal content within the Quran. So we look at the different academic debates about this and then uh, engage the students in relation to the materials available on, on, on this topic. Then we look at its, um, it's the nature of the text. Let me say the nature of the text in the sense that some of the texts are quite specific, that is, cut a and then some of them are quite speculative than me. And there are rules by which these relate with one another and in which they are interpreted. So students are exposed to these analysis of, I mean, the Quran as a reviewed text and its rules of interpretation, that is, I mean, uh, the science of tafsir, and also the legal content of it and how these interact with one another and how these are used as, I mean, sources of law. Then we look at the second main source of law, which is the Sunnah, and the debates around it. That is the nature of the Sunnah and the role, different roles that the Sunnah play, for example, as a complement to the Quran, and also, for example, as uh, a source that helps in explaining the, um, some of the general verses within the Quran. And also, I mean, as an independent source of law sometimes, actually. So we look at this and the debates about, I mean, uh, how the Sunnah evolved, uh, whether it was meant to be a source of law right from the beginning or it developed in that context later. So we examine all these and also look at the categorization of, I mean, the, the Sunnah in the essence of the science of Hadith. I mean, how the science of Hadith evolved, how it developed, and also the different books in that regard, different books of hadith in that regard by which students will be able to appreciate this second um, source of Islamic law. Then from there we look at the methods, that is the different methods of Islamic law by which the law is taken forward, um, such as I mean, Ijma, the principle of consensus and how this is reached and how does it complement the sources, how does it take the sources, that is the Quran and the Sunnah forward and also the uh, method Qiyas, analogy, by which uh, the sources, provisions within the sources are also taken for. We also examine principles, principles by which the law is applied, such as the principles of I mean, Maslaha, human benefit, the rura, necessity, uh, principles of I mean, Istihsan, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I, in relation to the jurisprudential perspective, we provide students with an in-depth understanding analysis of the sources, the principles, and the, uh, and the methods. Then, the second term, we look at, I mean, uh, substantive issues, uh, principally Islamic family law, whereby we look at issues of marriage, uh, the various provisions on marriage within the Quran, and the nature of marriage, the conditions, the rules regarding it, uh, according to the different schools of Islamic jurisprudence. I mean, we look at the different schools of Islamic jurisprudence and their positions, their views in relation to the relevant provisions regarding marriage. And obviously, we we'll also look at the rules relating to dissolution of marriages. That is, I mean, we we'll look at divorce uh, and, and so on and so forth. Then the rights of children, for example, within marriage, uh, and the right of spouses, for example, in relation to marriage and this, after its dissolution, we look at all these in the context uh, of uh, the evolution, that is the traditional provisions and how this has evolved, particularly in relation to the different Muslim majority countries, both in Asia, Africa, and um, particularly also in the, in the Middle East. 
And I mean, in, in that regard, the, the course is not only taught as uh, a system of law which is stuck in the past. Students are able to appreciate its traditional foundations and then they see step by step how this has evolved over time and also how this is now applied in modern Muslim states. We also look at the concept of, I mean, uh, codification, that is how codification, attempts at codifying Islamic law started and how this is now evolving in different Muslim states whereby the argument, I mean, that Islamic law uh, has moved from what is was traditionally known as jurist law to uh, I mean, uh, state law, perhaps part of state law and also judge's law now. So, and we look at modern, many modern cases, many cases from modern Muslim states uh, where Islamic uh, courts uh, do exist and how they try as much as possible to move the interpretation of Islamic law forward. And one important aspect also is the issue of modern legal theory. I mean, it is interesting to be able to appreciate that, I mean, modern contemporary jurists and scholars in Islamic law have, um, have tried to come out with different modern legal theories by which Islamic law responds to the dynamic nature of human life. So we examine all these different theories in the context of the sources, the Quran and the Sunnah itself, and also the classical um, um, jurisprudential rules of Islamic law, and uh, how this uh, continues to be applied in different parts of Muslim majority countries today. Therefore, I mean, our students go through an experience of understanding Islamic law in 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 its uh, uh, classical sense and it in its post-classical sense and in its modern sense so they don't learn about it i mean in a, a form as if the law was stuck in the past but rather they see it uh, in, in islamic law as living law whereby it is still applied and used in many um, muslim majority countries uh, today so by the time students have gone through this i mean uh, course they come out quite well versed and well taught and very appreciative of, of Islamic law as a separate uh, applicable legal system in its own right. Uh, and I mean, because this is a law school, uh, students are also able to see it from the lens of modern um, uh, Western law, modern British law. I mean, because we use examples. I mean, I mean um, everyone who teaches law in the school of law here, most of people who teach law in the school of law here also have experience as, I mean, as lawyers. So they are able to uh, bring this experience into in, into the course and students are able to see comparatively Islamic law in the light of, uh, for example, uh, British law and see how the similarities between them and also the differences, I mean, in relation to their application. So we teach it in a very, very interesting and very um, lively way, whereby at the end of the course every year, students express great satisfaction and good understanding of, of the course. So if, I mean, um, anyone is out there who is interested in uh, understanding Islamic law in the right perspective, SUAS is the right place to, uh, to be. As I said, it has been taught here, Islamic law has been taught here since 1948. I mean, by the leading experts in the subject area and continues to be taught by leading experts in that context uh, uh, as the years uh, progress on. So we look forward to welcoming you to SUAS to study Islamic law. Thank you.